And it's a real privilege today to be able to bring you our three uh, Bible passages today. Um, so the first of these passages is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 7 through to 15. The second one will come from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And the final passage comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 9 through to 17. John chapter 16, starting at verse 7. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, Then, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, It's wonderful to have a few more people in the building uh, with us and uh, leading us in the service today. As we begin this morning, uh, I want to begin with a story from the dim, dark pages of history, uh, back when we could travel overseas, if you can remember back then. Uh, I was 19, maybe not that long ago, uh, but I was traveling by myself for the first time, and I met a group of people through a Christian organization. One of them asked me if I was a Christian, 
I said, yes, I'm a Christian. It was about four years before that that God had, had brought me to trust wholeheartedly in Jesus. But she persisted, as in, are you born again? To which I wanted to say, yes, of course I am. But it began to dawn on me that this question was not so much about trusting in Jesus. This was a question about whether I'd had a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit. The implication being that perhaps if I hadn't, well, maybe I wasn't a genuine Christian. I suspect my confusion in that moment is not that uncommon. We know that being a Christian means trusting Jesus. So how does that connect to the work of the Spirit? What should we look for to know that the Spirit is at work in us? That we are born again? How will we know if, as our passage puts it, we are led by the Spirit? Of the three members of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, which we're looking at today, the Holy Spirit is the most elusive and in many cases the least well understood. So let's pray now and ask for the Spirit's help uh, to grasp who he is and what he does for us today. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, you spoke through the prophets and the apostles to give us the words of the Bible. Would you likewise speak to us through these same words? Enlighten us by your truth, strengthen us with your power, renew your life within us so that we might glorify our Heavenly Father in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, as I said, the, the Holy Spirit is, is the most obscure member of the Trinity. In the Apostles' Creed, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't give us that much to go on, does it? The Creed has ten lines about Jesus and what we believe about him, but all we get about the Holy Spirit is we believe in him. This is fitting in some ways because the Spirit is not often the main focus when we read through the Scriptures. There are moments, but more often the Spirit is at work uh, a bit more in the background without attracting too much attention to himself. As Jesus puts it in John 3, the work of the Spirit is like the wind. We see the evidence, but we don't see the Spirit directly. We can't predict where he will work next. The Spirit is elusive like that. And perhaps for that reason, there are lots of different views on the Spirit. Uh, for some of us, uh, particularly perhaps if you're new to church, the idea of the Holy Spirit could be a bit freaky, uh, unpredictable. Isn't that what the crazy Christians are into? Others of us may have had a very positive experience. We know that the Spirit is God's power in our life. And perhaps we've seen miracles of healing, speaking in tongues or other supernatural phenomena. Or perhaps the Holy Spirit is what we feel. It's that sensation when we know that God is close. That inner feeling of warmth and hope and peace. The assurance of God's love for you. And maybe some of us are just a bit confused about the Spirit. We know he exists, but we're a little hazy on what the Spirit is really all about. And in some ways it just seems safer to stick to reading the Bible and uh, not worry too much about what the Spirit is up to. So depending on our background and experiences, our understanding of the Spirit may be quite diverse. But that doesn't mean that just anything goes. Because the creed is not entirely elusive about the Spirit. Because that one line, we believe in the Holy Spirit, that actually says a whole lot, doesn't it? We do believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an optional extra for super-Christians. No, the Holy Spirit has always been a core part of Christian belief because the Holy Spirit is a gift given to every single Christian, everyone who trusts in Christ. So friends, if you trust in Jesus, then you are in Christ and his Spirit lives within you. Just as the Father and the Son are for all of us, open to all of us, so the Holy Spirit is for each of us. And the way the creed is structured shows us that the Holy Spirit sits alongside the Father and the Son. We believe in God the Father, 
We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the three members of the Trinity, equally God, equally worthy of our worship. And so when we think about the, whole, the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, we mustn't think that something other than God is at work here. The Holy Spirit is fully, equally God. The Holy Spirit's not the Father or the Son, but He is in perfect unity with the Father and the Son. He is, we might say, the, the personal presence of God carrying out God's purposes in the world. So that means when we talk of the Spirit, uh, we're not just talking about an impersonal force or a principle or, or an abstract being. We're talking about God, the third member of the Trinity. So hopefully we can see just a few points there by way of introduction that even though the Creed is brief about the Spirit, the Creed gives us a start. But I suspect we want to dig a bit deeper. So let's uh, open up the Bible. We're going to start with Jesus and his words about the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel, just before his death. In John 16, the passage we heard from Dave, Jesus promises that when he goes, he will send the advocate, uh, a helper, a comforter, one he calls the Spirit of Truth. And this name, the Spirit of Truth, uh, makes a lot of sense once we see what the Spirit will do. In John 16, 12, Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, to guide us into all truth. And he does this in two ways. First, he speaks to us from God. The spirit of God knows the mind of God. And he speaks to us what God wants us to hear. One of the key ways the Spirit has done this for us is through inspiring the authors of Scripture. Just as God's Spirit spoke through the prophets and those who wrote the Old Testament, so he inspired the authors of the New Testament. Many of those listening to Jesus uh, just before his death, as he spoke about the Spirit, were subsequently guided by the Spirit as they wrote Gospels and letters that now form our New Testament. We have the Scriptures because of the work of the Spirit of Truth. But the Spirit didn't stop His work back then. The Spirit of Truth continues to guide us into all truth. The Spirit helps us to read and to understand the Scriptures and to teach and encourage each other in line with the Scriptures. Uh, my wife, Ale, is a grade one teacher. One of her most important jobs is teaching kids to read. She often does this by sitting alongside one of her students, helping them to sound out the words, uh, to fit them into the sentence, and then to, to make sense of the whole. Sometimes, though, she needs to go a step further. She writes the text that the student will then read. She makes sure that it's exactly what she wants them to be learning. She writes the text and then she helps them to read it and to understand it. The Spirit's work is like that for us. He's written these words of Scripture for us so that he can now teach us and guide us using these same words. Friends, it's so important that we listen to the Spirit of Truth. By reading the Bible by seeking the Spirit's guidance as we do so. The Spirit is God leading us in all truth. So when you've got a big decision to make, when you're feeling lost and uncertain, turn to the Spirit of truth for guidance. Pray for God's Spirit to guide you into all truth. And open your Bible Read the words that the Spirit speaks to the church. We can also ask for advice from other Spirit-filled Christians. Reading and interpreting the Bible is a communal task, not just an individual one. And sometimes the Spirit uses others to guide us into all truth. But I, I need to just add a word of caution here. 
because the Spirit inspired the writing of the Scriptures, we must avoid pitting what the Spirit is saying now against what the Spirit has already said, as though God's Spirit of truth uh, would contradict himself. So if we think the Spirit is telling us something and leading us to make a certain decision, or if someone is speaking to us claiming to be hearing from the Spirit, uh, we're wise to check the Scriptures and ask others to help us compare it to Scripture to see what the Spirit has already said. Both the Old and New Testament encourage us, encourage us to be discerning about words of prophecy uh, as they may or may not be from God's Spirit. Nonetheless, uh, we do believe in the Holy Spirit. We trust God's Spirit of truth to guide us. As we read his word, the Spirit of truth will guide us in all truth. But friends, we actually need more help from God than that, don't we? We need more than just to know the truth. We need this advocate to do more for us. Because even when we know the truth, sometimes we're unable to, to obey the truth, to follow it, to do it. And Jesus speaks to this need in our readings from Acts chapter 1, where he previews one of those events where the Holy Spirit really does come front and centre into focus on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, You will receive power from the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. We see here that the Holy Spirit is not only the Spirit of truth, He is also the Spirit of power. You will receive power. God empowers His people by giving them His Spirit. This is how God works his power in us and through us. And again, there's two particular purposes that God empowers us for by his spirit. Firstly, the spirit gives power to witness to Christ. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus' followers receive the spirit and immediately they start telling the crowd around them about the wonders of God. The spirit gives them power to witness, even in different languages, so that everyone in the crowd can hear them, each in their own tongue. The Spirit equips God's church for mission and witness, so that we can speak the gospel and tell the world who Jesus is and what he's done for us. In fact, we could say evangelism is far more the work and the business of God's Holy Spirit than it is our work and business. The Spirit gives us the opportunity the Spirit gives us the words. The Spirit gives us the courage to speak. And the Spirit is also at work in the hearts of those we're speaking to. The Spirit convicts the heart. And the Spirit testifies to the truth of the gospel. At every step along the way in the work of evangelism, the Spirit is active and at work. Sometimes the spirit of power testifies to the truth of the gospel through signs and wonders. Sometimes miraculous healings or deliverance, works of power that reinforce the truth of the gospel. So we can pray for this kind of testimony from the spirit. We also know that it's comparatively rare. And so we need not be disappointed if God chooses to work by his spirit in different ways. Because evangelism is ultimately God's work, not ours. Friends, that's great news. Because it means that it's, it's not up to us to convince other people. If we don't have all the answers, if we're sometimes unsure of what would be best to say, that's okay. Evangelism is the Spirit's work through us. Jesus calls us to be faithful witnesses. But his spirit is the power at work when the gospel is shared. We don't need to win the argument. We don't need to have all the answers. But the spirit empowers us to be faithful witnesses. Secondly, the spirit of power also empowers us to serve. The spirit gives us gifts to serve one another. 
to build each other up in the faith. These are, are gifts like leadership, teaching, encouragement, generosity, evangelism, prophecy, speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Sometimes we might be tempted to think of this as being uh, filled with the Spirit. But we need to be a little careful in our language here. We are each full of God's Holy Spirit. We're already full. His Spirit dwells in all of us who are in Christ. But in another sense, the Scriptures uh, do say that sometimes the Spirit fills people with power to an extraordinary degree for a particular purpose. We can't control this. It doesn't mean that the rest of us are somehow deficient or, or that we're not pleasing God. No, it's just that sometimes he chooses to work through particular people. So again, we can pray for God's Spirit to work powerfully through us, to give us the gifts that we need to serve others and to witness to Christ. And whether it seems miraculous to us or not, we can be confident that God's Spirit is at work because he lives in each of us gives, and gives each of us the strength to serve others and to witness to Christ. So if we believe in the Spirit, we put that faith into action by serving each other. We ask the Spirit to empower us, to equip us to serve, and then we use the strength that the Spirit gives to love and serve one another. How might the Spirit be prompting you to serve others at the moment? How has the Spirit gifted and empowered you to serve others? Being led by the Spirit means serving others in the strength that the Spirit gives. So I encourage you to take some time this week. Draw on the power of the Spirit. Ask for God's spirit when we feel weak, for his strength. Ask for God's strength to bear witness to Christ and to serve others. And in our weariness and tiredness and grief, let's rest in his strength. When we cannot go on, that's okay, because he is strong. He is the one who can carry us and refresh us. He is the spirit of power, not only the spirit of truth. But even truth and power are not enough. God has to do more for us through his spirit because we are not just ignorant people needing the truth. and We're not just weak or oppressed people needing to be empowered. On our own, we're dead in sin. We need new life. Only God's Spirit can regenerate us and give us new life. In Romans 8, we see that the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit who gives life, the Spirit of life. In verse 11, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Can you see what's happening here? God, God raised Christ from, from the dead and so because his spirit lives in us, we too are raised to new life. God's spirit is the great life giver. He gave life to the first humans as God breathed his breath, his, his life-giving spirit into them. And now he gives new life to all those who are in Christ. And it's an incredible life, like uh, nothing we've experienced before. It's incredible for two reasons. Uh, firstly, we get a new family. When we get new life from the Spirit, we also get adopted into a new family with a new Heavenly Father. We can call him Dad, Abba. He calls us his children. We become co-heirs with Christ. This is a stunning promise for all who trust in Jesus. 
We have his spirit living in us as a guarantee, a deposit of our future inheritance with Christ. The spirit gives us the security of a new family, a family to love us and protect us, a, a, new, a family with a new identity as children of God. Being children of God, uh, we are brothers and sisters to each other. We treat each other as brother and sister, not because we agree on everything, which siblings do, but because we're united by the one spirit. We each share God's spirit. The spirit of life makes us children of God and co-heirs with Christ. He gives us a new family. The spirit of life also gives us a new character. This is the second reason that the new life of the spirit is incredible. The Spirit grows new fruit in us, a new character that's pleasing to God. Instead of living for sin, the Spirit helps us to live for God by growing us in ways that please our new Heavenly Father. This is hinted at in Romans 8. It says, We don't live according to the flesh, but instead, by the Spirit, we put to death the misdeeds of the flesh. The Spirit helps God's children to turn away from sin, to live a new lifestyle, one that is honouring to God, one that is fitting for our new family. Galatians 6 spells out <clears throat> excuse me, what this new character is. Have a listen, reflect on how God might have grown you in the past and might be growing you now. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I have a friend who sometimes gets stuck uh, to know what to pray for when she's asked to share a prayer request. So she's made a decision uh, that when she gets asked and she's not sure, She'll pick one of the fruit of the Spirit and ask to be prayed for to to grow in that respect, to grow in love or or patience or kindness. Perhaps you'd like to do the same. Pick one aspect of the fruit of the Spirit and pray for a week that the Spirit who gives life would grow you in this way, in in self-control or peace or gentleness Because God's spirit loves to give new life. He's the spirit of life, just as he's the spirit of truth and the spirit of power. We began today by thinking about how the Holy Spirit is elusive, a bit hard to pin down. He's God, and so he acts according to God's priorities, not our control. Yet we can also be confident The Spirit lives in us. And He is the Spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. And so we follow His leading as we read His Word. He's the Spirit of power who strengthens us and gives us gifts. And so we share the gospel and we serve others in the power that He gives. And He's the Spirit of life. He's the one who gives life to us who are dead in sin. And because of the Spirit, we are children of God. And he's growing us more like Jesus every day. So let's pray and thank our Heavenly Father now. And let's ask that the Spirit would continue his good work in us individually and as a community. Please join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the gift of your Spirit. Thank you that the Spirit spoke through the apostles and the prophets to give us the Bible. Thank you that the Spirit continues to guide us in truth today. Thank you for how your Spirit empowers us to serve you. Please keep giving us strength to live faithful lives. Thank you that your Spirit gives us new life, even though we were dead in sin. Help us to keep in step with the Spirit 
as we grow more like Jesus. In his name, amen.